This is your theater. This is her theater. Her family owns this theater, which is um, pretty darn cool. It feels good to be here. It feels very comfortable. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you live? Is my microphone working? No. Yeah. I was told to grab this one. Or grab it. <laughs> Click it on. It's, oh, there we go. That's what I got to do. How are we doing that? Yeah. yeah. Hey. Look at All right. We are amazing. Technolo technologically challenged people. <laughs> well, you know me. It is what it is. It is okay. Uh, okay. I'd like to start by just thanking you for coming out today. I think everyone really appreciated it and found it very special that you came past the sign spot. <laughs> I think it was Beth's idea. Was that your idea, Beth? Because that was, that was kind of a cool... I think, yes. I think that's oh. Kelly. That's Kelly. Kelly, it was your idea. Thank you for doing that. That was fun. I was so worried I was going to be coming from the wrong direction. <laughs> On the cigar, I was like, oh dear. Right towards the end, I was like, oh, maybe I better get there a little bit early. You know, I was one minute early. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. But I said, just in case I had to turn around and go back the other way. <laughs> kind of hedging a little bit. <laughs> and, and I would like to wish you a belated happy birthday. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. How old did you turn 42? So, so, that's a lot. So if you're game for some questions, we have some questions that people submitted to me and to on cards. Oh, it would be my pleasure. All right. Um, let's start with... Let's start from the very beginning. Very good place to start. There it is. You win. You win the entire prize. I don't know what that prize is, but you just won. Yes. So, I'd like to start with... Uh, historically, you have not engaged with large-scale fan events, uh, and starting in 2022, you went to Spooky Empire, and then you have you here today. Yes. Uh, what changed for you uh, that caused you to engage with the fan <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, I think it, it, I think it has more to do with growing older, and and I've, I've always had a great appreciation for my fans. Um, I think, honestly, that the fans had a great deal to do with the fact that Twin Peaks returned after the 25, 26, 27 years because of their um, constant heart. <laughs> <laughs> I was my I don't know. <laughs> um, no, no, honestly, I think they, I think they initiated a kind of a a movement for, for David and for Mark, Mark Frost, to get back together again um, and to come up with a, a story. And also I think um, you know, David is the kind of director, and he says this, that he, he really needs to get an idea. He talks about the idea being the most important thing, and I think he was waiting for, for that to come to the surface. I always think it's sort of like the magic eight ball, you know, you turn over and something floats up to the top. And, he was waiting for kind of how he was going to approach it. Um, so I, um, anyway, I, I've, I've always just loved the fans, and I felt like this was a kind of a, I don't know, it felt right, right time to come and and uh, and to have had the experience that so many of my castmates have talked about and said how much joy that they had doing it, and I think they felt the, the from the fans as well. Um, and I know the fans here, you're like the core diehard fan. This is like the red hot fan. I'm just, I'm just, you know, getting the heat from, from y'all. So it's very cool. Thank you. There, there's, there's two places I would go from that. I'll start with one place, which is, uh, you may not have seen it, but there's an infamous, infamous video of the premiere of Fire Walk With Me, which took place in this theater. Yeah. And David spoke, oh, wow. and okay. the video has David uh, describing the smell of the theater. And so the video has sort of a, a legend uh, in the area. Uh, not to put you on the spot in front yeah. of that, uh, yeah. but would you, on, on the record, want to comment on the smell of the theater? I would be so happy to comment on the smell of the theater. So this is nostalgia for me. I grew up in Yakima, Washington, a small town to the east. Um, and we had, uh, our theater there was the Capitol Theater, which is actually a, a little bit larger, the Roadhouse Theater that was built there. Um, and it had many lives. Movie house, performance. I've gone to see movies there, and I've actually performed on stage with the Yakima Symphony Orchestra years and years ago. Um, and it's a beautiful house. But to walk into this 
beautifully maintained, not really restored, I mean restored in some areas, but really this is kind of the original. And to walk through that and to smell that popcorn was like magic to me. I went right back to my days at the Capitol Theater going to see, most of the time I saw Disney movies because that's all my parents allowed us to see. <laughs> but those were fun. And to have that experience, mm -hmm. I, it was a great sense of nostalgia for me. Excellent. Um, yeah, it really made me, makes me feel very much at home. So Excellent. thanks for doing that. Thanks for bringing the popcorn machine in for that. <laughs> that is the biggest popcorn machine I think I've ever seen in my life. Honest to God. It was huge. We should be a top one for days. <laughs> now, make, make sure I've got the right question here. So here we go. So since we talked a bit about the return and about yes. David Green's show back, one question we have here is, so other than David Lynch and Mark Frost, you were the only cast member who was able to read the complete script for Twin Peaks The Return. Yes. I'm not going to ask you to expose any secrets of that, <laughs> but I want to ask that given that you knew the story going in, you right. knew the whole story before it started filming. Right. Did the final show surprise you in any way? Well, I did know most of the story, but the last bits David um, kept. Okay. So I didn't know what the ending was going to be. Um, so I did. It was a. It was about a four-hour, five-hour sit down, read the script. I think the script might have been. You know, like the old phone booths, it was like chained to the wall. I think it was like chained to the wall, so there was no way I could take it. Even the coffee made the coffee. Like but it was a very, um, you know, it's kind of a steady going through and reading and, and recognizing kind of what I needed to do. Um, and that there were going to be, and David had explained to me there were going to be three plus characters that I was going to have to portray and and getting as I got into it getting very nervous um, not so much about the Dougie character I sort of had a vibe I kind of knew what that was going to be like At least I wasn't nervous reading the script when I got to the doing of it in front of the camera I got very nervous because so much stillness so much not doing anything I said this is going to be the most boring thing that anyone has ever seen. No. But in fact, it actually it turned out really well. But I felt I had to sort of up my courage quotient just to believe that it was going to be okay. But the, the you know, the evil, the doppelganger, the evil Cooper was also uh, called him lovingly Mr. C. Um, I recognized from reading the script that if, unless he was absolutely the darkest, most vile character ever, that this series wasn't going to work because you needed to be you needed to be a presence like a bad presence, and I never really done you know I walked a little bit I did a I did a a film called uh, Where the Day Takes You where I played kind of a bad guy so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I saw that and I said, run right out it's available now I'm afraid to understand you what but anyway the um, but hadn't really dipped into that you know, in terms of my my work, I was nervous that I was going to be able to pull it off, but I said, well, you know, we're going to find him, and I've got David Lynch, you know, right there steering the ship, so I said, it, we'll, we'll make it work somehow, which um, turned out really, turned out better than I thought it. <laughs> I was very happy every day at the end of filming to be able to take that leather jacket off and take off that wig and kind of return to me, because he was, he was a very unpleasant person. Uh, he did very unpleasant things. Um, but uh, that was the thing that left out at me in reading it, you know. Um, and I, I, you know, you just know with David that he's going to take you on a journey um, and you're going to see stuff that's not even really on the page. You can read it, but it's going to be transformed visually by what he does. I knew that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And you could be soundproof, but then you'd also continue to watch the movie, but you'd have to, you know, have to take care of your child. And I said, they need that on planes. They need that on the next flight. The last flight, we're going to put a cry room. Uh, I'm not
So for me, right, for me. <laughs> so going back a little farther yes. to, to the filming of the pilot of Twin Peaks, which yes. was done here. Yes, it was. Is there a point during the filming of the pilot, or at what point after, does the possible future impact of the show upon television, when does it hit you? Uh, we, you know, not, not during the filming of the pilot necessarily. I think everyone who was on the um, the set, everyone who was involved in the show, felt this would never go past one episode. This was going to be, this was going to be a pilot. They're calling it a pilot, backdoor pilot is the term, but it's going to be a movie of the week. There's no way. And it's probably not going to be on until two o'clock in the morning. So, uh, we were all like, we're fine. We all signed the five and a half year contract that they make you do. Um, and had a great time filming, really enjoyed it. It was fun to be back in Seattle. I, I graduated from the University of Washington in 82, and this was in 89, so I got to come back. I actually had some money. I could go to restaurants, it was really fun. <laughs> Enjoy Seattle. Um, so the filming was great. Um, and then I was off doing a, another film that will remain nameless. Um, uh, what was it called? The Boyfriend's School. Don't tell her it's me. Don't tell her it's me. Steve Gutenberg and Shelley Long, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> Run right out to see that one. <laughs> anyway, while I was there, there was a, the Steve's manager, a guy named Keith Addis, was there. And, and he got a call from his partner in LA who had seen the pilot, they screened the pilot. And she said, You must sign him. And so, and I didn't have a manager at the time. I thought, oh, this would be kind of fun, what the heck. So I said, sure. Um, that was my first, like, there was a rumbling of something that was good, you know? Um, so I was like, oh, this kind of, this kind of interesting. Um, but we filmed the pilot, and ABC said, we're going to put you on as a mid season replacement. We want to buy seven episodes or so. And we're going to, we filmed everything before it went to air. So we really had no idea until we kind of found and wrapped and didn't know if we were going to go even further. It was kind of fun just to do those extra ones. And then it obviously launched and, and then it went um, crazy. And in a kind of an unusual way, you know, if, if social had been around at that time, it would have exploded. Um, but it exploded anyway, just word of mouth and people were writing about it. And it was like nothing they'd ever seen on television. This is, of course, during the era when you know, you could watch L.A. Law, you could watch Roseanne, great shows, you know what I mean? But there was nothing to prepare the audience for what Twin Peaks was. You took a, an author, surreal filmmaker, stuck him into the world of television and said, create something. And he did, and people didn't know what they were saying. It was really, it was a, it was a brain-bending adventure for most of America, and the world, actually. Thank you. Um, we to to a touch yes. to our fire walk with me, yep. and also Wild Apart, which was shown here last night. Oh, um, nice, nice quick book. There was a MTV Awards appearance. That Chris Isaac got an award, right? And it was via satellite. You and him were in, you know, on, on MTV via satellite right. for the, for him to get that award. So cool. And he threw to you to ask you about your experience on being at Wild Apart. You may not remember this. <laughs> I think I've blocked, uh, blocked, uh, blocked this out. <laughs> what did I say? What did I do? What was it? So, he, so he, he said, you know, well, it's, it's, it's not up to me because I just have the song. I'm not in the movie. Let me ask Kyle who's in the movie. And, and then you, you sort of slump. <laughs> I'm not in the movie. So the question that had been submitted was, who came up with the skit? And clearly, you don't remember it? I don't remember. Must have, maybe it was, must have been David. Maybe David suggested something. Um, or Chris, Chris did, who was a lovely, lovely guy. I remember that much about him. Um, and so talented. Um, but I, I, it was, you know, it's fun to be able to, to poke fun at yourself a little bit. Absolutely. And, and enjoy that. I love that. So. And, and then with that came a related question, and this, this is sort of getting you to, are you willing to talk about it type stuff? Right. So this afternoon, we're going to do a film discussion of missing pieces. Okay. And so one of the questions that was submitted was, you're there doing this remote live session with Chris Isaac, and so the question was, did you and Chris have scenes together uh, that, that are still missing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, 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 no there, were, there are, I don't recall any scenes that I had with Chris. Um, sadly, that would have been really fun. Um, 
so I don't remember. I did have a couple scenes with David Bowie. Yes. And those are those those are pretty <laughs> special. I have it's a hard to forget. I have a Polaroid of David and I in the sort of dressing room when you see sort of sort of misbehaving crazy, and it's um, from my church. He's such a lovely guy. He's such a accessible, friendly, creative person. I didn't expect that. I expected it was going to be some kind of weird thing. And he was like just very regular, kind of nice. Okay. Well, I have one more sort of classic Twin Peaks question, then we have a couple questions about other roles. But there are no other roles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got a question from Jeff Moore, who worked on the production season two. Okay. And he talked about the experience of watching you on the final all nighter of okay. season two. Yes. That that long night shoot and watching all the different emotions you had to convey and the roles you had to play. Uh, and he was he was just sort of curious about what that's like for you as an actor having to go through all those different things all in, in one long night. Well it takes a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's really the part of the fun of doing it. Um, it's the when they ask you to do something unex sort of unexpected and you're trying to nail it and you get to kind of go off into a different tangent. Not unlike the, um, the SNL skit that we saw. That, the, that season, that was the season opener. I think it was season, it was 1990. That was 15 or 16, that season anyway. Um, and, if we, and you're really running from set to set backstage because you have a commercial break and you gotta get you know you gotta get to the next thing so um it's a, and you're just kind of jumping from Scottish shop from to cooper to the, the singing cowboy you know all you know all over the place um, and i love that kind of energy so it really feeds on itself um, and i was also really excited because the whole mirror smash uh with frank silva and timing that and trying to get that just right and then, uh, you know, Annie, the whole, or Annie, I was like, oh, like, oh boy, okay. Um, this is gonna be really, I was really excited about the next season. <laughs> like, oh, okay, Cooper gets to be crazy. Uh, oh, boy, it's gonna be so much fun. So much fun, and then, of course, the next season never happened. But, well, it did happen. Well, it did, yeah. Um, it really made me wait. So, so jumping to other roles, yeah. one question was, do you have a favorite memory from the film you do? Oh gosh, yeah. That was, that was, that was, that was such, um, such an experience. I mean, fresh out of school, no, you know, front of the camera film work experience um, ever. Um, moving to Mexico City, meeting Many of the actors I worked with were my heroes. So the Jurgen Prock now played my dad. Yeah. I'd watched him as a student in college when I was going through my training in Das Boot. We gone out um, in Seattle. We were in Seattle, of course, so many theaters, right? So we went to see Das Boot, and it was like this man, this captain, he's so powerful. What a presence, you know? I mean, this was an amazing performance. You know, cut to not even a year later, there I was meeting Jürgen as my dad. <laughs> Just that kind of crazy, how does this even happen? Max von Sydow, the first time I knew Max was standing outside the Ornithopter, a huge fan of Max von Sydow. The guy's six eight or something. <laughs> huge, you know. That voice of Max von Sydow. And just, and also very, just a kind guy, very gentle guy. Um, he was actually in Mexico, I met his family as well, they were there, they're all tall. <laughs> um, just the people, you know, forget about wearing that crazy still suit, oh my god, <laughs> um, or even the weird one with the flaps that rolled up, that thing, oh my god, um, thank you Bob Ringwood, um, it was really the people that made it special for me um, across the board and, and uh, spending time with them, so, Patrick Stewart, imitating oh, Patrick. Patrick Stewart, <laughs> don't, what a monster. <laughs> I've been resisting the urge to ask you to do a David invitation because it naturally comes out in every cast member's stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. like you can't help it. Kale. Kale. <laughs> calls me Kale because maybe you know the story, but Dino, who produced Dune, couldn't say Kyle. He just said Kale. 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 
How old you are? <laughs> I'll be one, 23. Is that your hair? <laughs> yes. Uh, he had a voice. He was a very scary boy. He had dark eyes. Um, you shouldn't say hi. So he called me Kale, and David loved it. <laughs> so he started calling me Kale from Dune. That's how long it's been. Now I have a son. His name is Callum. You know what David calls us? Kale. Callum. Callum. Um, yeah, David's great. He's got that kind of up here. Okay, now listen. We're gonna shoot this, and he's got kind of that little bit of a nasal, and and kind of he'll go mysterious, and he'll do this with his fingers, and uh, and then he'll sometimes he'll close his jacket. And there's a picture of us from the set of Blue Velvet. We're both like with our jackets. <laughs> Just about my my best friend in the world. What a Wonderful, wonderful guy. Love him dearly. Good guy. Did, and which you also bring to mind, did you see uh, the Paul Giamatti uh, footage in the Criterion closet that aired yesterday? I saw that Blue Velvet was one of his picks, and I met Paul for the first time not long ago, a couple of months ago, at like an event out and about promotion, promoting. Well, I went to see the Holdovers, mm -hmm. which I love. I highly recommend the Holdovers. Yeah. Great film. Um, and he was there at the after event. And just went up to him and said, well, how would he fan? I've been him forever. And he looked at me and said, you don't understand. He said, he was like, blue velvet, David Lynch. He was very, very uh, affected by David's work. And, and that was so sweet. It's nice when you meet someone and you have kind of this mutual, you're great. No, you're great. No, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice. On the subject of roles you didn't play, one yeah. of the common things we have here is people confuse a show filmed on this side of the pass with a show filmed on the other side of the pass. Yeah. There are no other shows. Exactly. <laughs> Have you ever had someone ask you about how it was to be on North Exposure? Yes, <laughs> I have. I have. I have. And so, of course, I go into a long, detailed explanation. <laughs> so great. It's an amazing working around Rosalind. Fantastic. We've got a bar out there that's just amazing. John Corbett, not a nice guy. But he's a guy. I love like John on, on, on Sex and the City. He's a good guy. He's a really good guy. And going yeah. to a slightly deeper cut, what led you to accept the role of FDR in Atlanta Crossing? Well, they sent, they offered, they said, we have interest in you, know, in you from this production that's happening in Scandinavia um, about this film and the, the role of FDR. And I perked up immediately, you know, being a kind of a, um, not, not a beneficiado, but certainly like a fan of FDR. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, I read the script and I liked it. And then I spoke with the director, Alexander Eich, who's um, super, super intelligent um, from Norway, uh, young guy, just loved what he had to say. So I just threw my lot in. I said, sure, I'm going to go. And so I flew to Prague and uh, met everybody. And, you know, I've done a lot of research which they appreciated. I worked really hard on um, all the work with the wheelchair and the braces, and I just did all the all the stuff I was supposed to do. And I found so nice that they were they took everything really seriously. It wasn't just going to be like a half-ass sorry production. This was like full on, really heartfelt. They were telling the story that meant the most to them. So Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, all the public. Uh, television stations had put up the money for this, financed this. So this was like a real personal story, and they felt tremendous responsibility to tell the story um, about um, the Crompton's Margaret and, and the struggles during World War II. It's really a, I think it's a, it was on PBS, a pretty good show. If you, if you, I don't know if it's even available or not, but I found it to be very well done, and I was happy to be part of it. And I got to do FDR, and I had a lot of fun. I had so much fun. He was such a bon vivant. There were so many things about him that I just said, he just loves what he does and life and women and, you know, he likes to drink and he loves to hang out with Churchill and they like to talk all night long. And he was just a really kind of a larger than life character that I, and I worked with um, Harry Harrison who played um, Eleanor. She was just, she was the only other American on it. She was absolutely fantastic. She's a theater actor. She's done many, many things. She's super talented. It was a great experience. Great experience. Prague was, and Prague was really as a beautiful city. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we also got someone wanted to know what your favorite dinosaur is. <laughs> 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 favorite dinosaur? 
Wow, well, I would see myself, but <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> you know, um, my, so my son's 15, and we went through the whole dinosaur thing, of course, and, and all of the Jurassic Parks and everything like that. So I guess my favorite dinosaur would be Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who doesn't like Tyrannosaurus Rex? Come on, man. That's just like, you know, the scary one. I was reading something that the sound of that growl is actually a koala bear. Did anyone see that? I don't know if it's real or not. I mean, you never know. You know, on, on Instagram, what's real or what's not real. But someone was saying, oh no, they, the koala bears, if you listen to their little growl and then you, you know, amplify it. They're not so cute. <laughs> They're scary little creatures. Weird. Mm. No. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of tribute for well, I also have the question of whether you like Heineken. Uh, I couldn't believe that no one has you on record for this. You know, I think it's like all of you. You know. Rainier, of course, one of my favorites. <laughs> and Olympia from Tumwater, Washington. Where in the hell is it from Water Washington? We don't even know. But um, I like, uh, I do, I sort of like all beer. It's weird because I hate to, I mean, I don't mind the name. It's, I like all coffee. It has to be pretty darn bad or very weak for me not to like it. But I'll drink it. Man. I mean, I make coffee sometimes. The next day I microwave it. So I'll <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> We also have the question of what made you make the beacons of podcast? Oh, podcasting. Yeah, I've got a podcast out right now called Mom. <laughs> um, you know, it was a combination of hearing this crazy story and then kind of sticking it in the back of my brain going, that's kind of interesting. I don't know what I would do with that. And then over the over COVID, it sort of became everything became about podcasting. And I said, well, this actually this story would really work, I think, as a podcast. So I kind of made a little inquiry with a friend who was investigative journalist, Josh Davis, who does this kind of thing. He goes into crazy, sometimes dangerous locations and just to get a story. And I said, you know, what do you think about this? And he said, yeah, definitely a story, let's go. And so together we went to the little community in North Carolina. North Carolina, I spent a lot of time in North Carolina. It's very weird to me, <laughs> very weird. Because the very first time I ever worked on the theater in a kind of a, in a professional way was at the Flat Rock Playhouse. Woo! Yay! <laughs> go Flat Rock. This is a little tiny community outside, uh, about 20 minutes from Asheville, 25 minutes from Asheville. And I was there for two summers. Of course, we shot Blue Velvet in right. Wilmington. Um, so that's you know, that's on the coast. And then there's, and there were a couple other things in, in addition. I can't remember, but the reason I was there. And then podcast was there in Barnum County, North Carolina, on the coast as well, south of Wilmington, about an hour's drive. Um, I'm like, what is it with North Carolina? And what's going on here? This is really strange. But the podcast was really about kind of things coming together. And we went down there. We spent six days interviewing with all the people that were involved in this story to drug-related story about this very small, you can't even really call it a town. I mean, it's a community of 300 people, but there's no real center apart from the downtown mm -hmm. kind of pier and the wharf, and there's a couple buildings there. And they would bring in huge amounts of drugs from South America, up from Pablo Escobar, so they said we're gonna do with Pablo's cartel. And they were making, just, they were minting money. It's like everybody was making $10,000 a night offloading these shipments. These are, this is a shipping village. $10,000 is like a year maybe or more salary. They were making it in a night. And so it changed the town, it changed the people. Everything you know, went crazy. Then it kind of exploded and then it kind of settled back down. Everything is kind of back to where it used to be. It's a very odd little cycle, I think. So we explored this town and what it did to the people and then who they are now and what happened to them and, and their perspective. And it, turned, it turned out pretty well. We're, we're like a little, little more than halfway through eight episodes. And it's a really easy listen. They're very short episodes. So it doesn't take much time. Okay, we can try to to give you a few more questions. Yeah, please. Okay. Are they okay for a little more? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I made a mistake because some people in the room have my cell phone number. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But she, she talked to us. She talked to us. She, she wants to know what, well, we know what David Cooper's favorite 
flavor of pie. She wants to know what Tom Bachman's favorite. Oh, pie my favorite flavor of pie. Wow. Because I've been to, to, on record that cherry pie is not my favorite, actually. Right. Um, a good cherry pie is actually pretty good. I think it has to do with that gelatin stuff and textural. Yes. Like, I'm not a huge mushroom fan, and the texture thing there. Jello, uh, makes me so nervous. <laughs> um, but I do like, um, my dad used to make apple pie. He used to make them as a really great cook. Uh, and those were really good. Um, and they were apples from our backyard where I grew up. So in Yakima, full of apples. Um, in fact, we have a pippin tree in our backyard, which is a, a, an unusual variety. It's a good apple. It's a good apple. Good. <laughs> I feel like a man you ripped my head. Yeah, you ripped my head. Oh, that's good crap. It's good crap. Um, that's something my brothers and I do all the time. It's a reference to when I do good. Um, and key lime pie. Yeah! yeah. I know. Uh, pecan, pecan, pecan pie. Pecan pie. Pecan pie. Yeah. Um, it's pretty good. So I, that, those, those kind of pies, I think, work best for me. Um, Huckleberry. Oh gosh, Huckleberry Pie is a no-brainer. That's absolutely the best. Shepherd's Pie wins. Which one? Shepherd's Pie. Shepherd's Pie. Oh, look, look who's going in the table. It's not in a pie shape, but it's still a pie. It's still a pie. I do love a Shepherd's Pie. I have to do it with like a crumpled lamb or beef, though I don't like to get into the organ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's okay. But um, yeah, that's, that works for me, too. Rhubarb Pie. Oh, that's it. Rhubarb Pie. The Strawberry Rhubarb Pie. How did I forget that? Rhubarb is one of my favorites. It's that yeah. bitter, sweet kind of thing part. that you have to have a cup of coffee with. Yeah. You have to have a cup of coffee with that. Um, so those all work. But the cherry pie's okay. You know, a good, a good one. <laughs> it's kind of that mix. <laughs> you have a favorite pursued by a bear wine that you would pair with your favorite product? Oh, interesting. Oh. Interesting. Um, wow. Yeah, I might, uh, I would probably go into more, like a, more of the rosé. Um, and I have a new white uh, Chardonnay. I was going to ask, yes. Yeah, which is uh, just, uh, we've had one vintage of that, the second will be coming soon, it's really good. Um, and I think that would work well with it. All the wines from Washington, people may know this, is there's a, because of the shift of temperature during the summer, during the growing months, the acid of the wine is really, that's what makes it kind of uh, work, pair really well with something sweet. Mm -hmm. The acid kind of washes it through, or with cheese, washes it through. It's really the beautiful quality that comes with making wine in Washington. So, one of those would work. Nice. Yeah. And, and, uh, I just have to make a coffee. I do have a coffee, actually. <laughs> I have a blend of coffee that I make with the guys up at the Walla Walla Road Street in Walla Walla, Thomas and Reese, in Mary Center. And uh, Thomas has been there. He's this old Stumptown guy. We uh, do Walla Walla, roasts his own stuff, and we did a blend. And he playfully called I let him kind of leave. He said he called it melange. It's brown bear <laughs> melange, because he loves to. Um, and it's sort of a darker roast, more more coffee, um, more coffee, chocolate kind of mocha flavors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a big, I'm not a big sort of a, a bright citrus quality in wine. I think it's it's I mean in coffee, sure. it's a great it's a great thing. But I, I tend to like a little darker, richer, mm -hmm. rounder flavor profile. So there you go. And that, that was a very important thing to tell you. <laughs> Anything else you would have liked me to ask you about? Um, good question. No, no I'm, I, we, we covered a good right. bit of territory. <laughs> I just want to thank you for, for agreeing to come up and, and chit chat with me. That's really nice. Thank you for making the stop. Uh, and this was a question of having been an actor for four decades now. Oh, is there a. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so, uh, for, been an actor for six years. Yeah, yeah, six years. Yeah. Uh, is there a piece of advice or direction uh, that someone gave to you that you still carry with you over the years? And if, what was that advice oh. and who shared it with you? Oh, gosh. Um, lots of advice. What are you doing in this business? <laughs> um, you know, I. I had a very, uh, first of all, thank you, and I, I'm very, very grateful to have been around for as long as I have. It's when you start out, you just have no idea what's gonna happen, and so I, I've, I've had tremendous gratitude that I'm still working, I still really love what I do. Um, but well, I went through uh, a very intense training program when I was at the University of Washington, three years acting training, really repertory theater training for people that love to act. Um, and my teacher, uh, Dr. Robert Hobbs, um, was was had a profound influence on me. I didn't want him to know that he did, but he had a profound influence on me. 
because I was a terrible student. Um, and none of the exercises that I did, I, he was really happy with. Which is fine, he's not supposed to be happy with any of the exercises. But he had a couple, he had a couple of phrases that, that always stick with me. That's mostly, not so much life oriented, um, but it could be. Uh, but more about just your pro, uh, an actor's process. So one of the first and most important lessons I learned um, is an exercise called talking and listening. Okay. And it's T and L, and it's very simple. You talk, the other actor listens, they talk, you listen, and you do all of your creation within that, you know, within that exchange. So I said, okay, that's it's a very simple exercise, very difficult exercise to do, to forget that you've heard this before, you know, five or six or seven or 10 or 12 times. You have to hear it for the first time. And the other one he did, he would shout it from the back of the room, and we'd say, yes, but what are you doing? <laughs> Which is all about, what's your process? Where's your, what's the, what, what are you trying to get to? And I think about that when I'm just in life. What are you doing? It's like, well, what am I, what am I doing? Am I really involved here, or am I just kind of going through the motions? So those, those two little phrases stick with me. Um, and he was uh, a very, very boisterous, high energy, guy that just was an extraordinary teacher. Really lucky to have him. So, a couple of things from the past. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll do a quick and then we're going to say goodbye to Kyle, and then we'll have a reset before the next event, so you get to get a chance to take a bio break and come back. Uh, before we thank Kyle for coming here, can we get a round of applause for the Chamber of Commerce? And